Uh, we have time for uh, about uh, 20 minutes or so of discussion, uh, questions, clarifications, et cetera. Um, and I'll do a, a five minute uh, wrap up at that point. So uh, Mark, we'd like to kick things off. Yeah, so I wanted to <clears throat> build on uh, Dave Valley's uh, comment earlier about um, you know the gift that keeps on giving. I think there's an opportunity uh, in a network like Emerge to think about uh, a different form of decision support, uh, which might be categorized as diagnostic decision support. So again, to pick up on the um, uh, Dan Roden's uh, suggestion about chronic renal disease, uh, we have um, instances where people, as they move through their trajectory of health, present with a problem. Um, when we look at a, a sequence um, in a healthy population, we're going to have a very high uh, bar in terms of returning results because these are individuals that have a very low prior probability of disease. But when somebody develops a disease, um, it's a very different metric. And in that case, you might go back and look at things that you wouldn't have otherwise looked at uh, from a population-based perspective. And so you could imagine a scenario where um, a, a decision support uh, algorithm uh, or rule fired when chronic renal disease appeared on problem list. And if that patient had a sequence, you'd go back and say, show me the variants in all of the genes that are associated with chronic renal disease that might be irrelevant to this patient could affect management. And maybe there's a GLA variant, that, and this individual has Fabry disease, in which case there's a specific treatment. Um, that gets away from some of the problems that Mike was referring to earlier, where what, what do we do when we dump all this information in there? Well, if you actually have a condition uh, and a genetic explanation that explains the condition, now you have a very cogent medical management issue. And I think that that's a use case that could be explored in a context like Emerge. I would just say that that type of example is exactly the kind of thing that the EHRI working group expressed the most excitement about, something where there's a focused clinical problem we can deal with, you know, really making sure that we, we get the structured data we need, you know, really robustly, and then, and then, and then measure, measure the effects. And then, once that's done, look to general. It, it really adds a clinical context to the question. And I, I think we can get our heads around that a little bit easier. Josh Peterson? Yeah, so I had a comment, which is that, um, so just based on, like, 15, 20 years of experience with CDS, um, I think one of the things I've observed is that these sort of broad superficial systems that are based on simple rules have a really high failure rate, um, and it's 90 plus percent, so um, drug-drug interaction is a good example of that. Um, and I wanted this group, when they're talking about CDS, to maybe think about the other end, which is uh, deeply modeled clinical decisions that include genetic data, but also include other kinds of clinical information. And this is the kind of thing in our system, at least, I've noticed people are uh, very amenable to interacting with. Uh, so, for example, our work from calculator is very successful. It includes lots of different clinical uh, pieces of data. It gets 80-plus percent response rates where they agree with the recommendation. Um, and on the other side of the coin, we have plenty of CDS, which, you know, people ignore and blow through. So, um, I, you know, so the, the challenge here is since we're dealing with a lot of different genetic scenarios, um, we could easily fall into the trap of trying to do a little something for each one of them. And I think we want to make sure we do we solve the problem very well for each one that is included in our network. Thanks. Kim? So uh, I, I completely agree with that comment, and I thought all the talks were excellent. Everything really resonated. Um, I guess just one question, comment, just ar around those lines is, um, I think the technology is now coming that we can create alerts, reminders pretty well with some of the emerging technologies. I think the main issue is that we've really contaminated the field with alert fatigue, where we've we put in so much sort of useless stuff into the system because we have, and the way I interpret it is because we can't really share, for the most part, we've been basically building our own fairly low quality, noisy stuff into our system and people have just realized this is most of the time not useful, so I'm going to ignore. And we mostly have like 90% override rates, right? So my concern would be if you build things, even it's, if it's super duper good, in the context of lots of really meaningless noise, the people are going to just ignore it. So I'm wondering just with that concern, uh, whether it might be worth uh, taking the app approach. 
where somebody has to, it, it, people will only use it essentially if they decide to go to it, but you aren't contaminated by the legacy that we put into our EHR systems. A couple of thoughts. Can I, I, I think the app approach is actually, of course, coming into its own with the emerging standards and the, the smart on fire, smart container type of work. And, you know, it can actually be, you know, a dialogue, of course, can be interactive and can be, you know, sort of abide by more of the Ten Commandments, if you will, for CDS. So that's very attractive. I think the other thing to think about, though, with sort of CDS in the future is not everything has to be an alert or a reminder at a level. In a way, I'm encouraged by pharmacogenomics, just given the specificity at one level. But secondarily, might there be, might not there be surveillance algorithms um, some other conditions are amenable to this as well, uh, you know, that are sort of scanning and, and anticipating or predicting, you know, and they're only popping up when absolutely necessary, if that makes sense. Uh, certainly some of the uh, cardiac weak risk decompensation decomp algorithms have been very successful in this regard. It's not an alert until the patient is actually trending and you need to know. Eric? Yeah, Eric Larson from Seattle. I, I am uh, carrying on, I think, the last two comments in most systems, the demand for CDS uh, by, by advocates exceeds the supply of the ability of the system to actually incorporate it. So I really liked uh, Sandy's comment about evaluating something at the beginning before you implement it and being able to tell a story. So maybe you could comment on all, all four of you or three of you on what, what, what would be a convincing story that we could develop in Emerge 4 or just the field could develop that would make a system like, uh, say, all of Kaiser want to uh, implement this kind of work. I can speak to what, what we're finding internally. So within partners, we have this effort to start building smart on fire apps. And, you know, and we do find that the demand exceeds the supply. And what, what always happens is it starts with somebody with an idea on how machine learning could be interjected into care in order to, to improve a decision. And where it inevitably goes is that the clinical process itself is so mixed up that you don't need machine learning. You just need to start pulling data together and enabling folks to contextualize it in order to make a difference. And then that can set you up for future machine learning-based interventions. So I think one way to do this is to one of the things we hear again and again is clinicians having to make a decision and having to spend 20 minutes going through the EHR, gathering all of the data that they need in order to make that decision. So just looking at the conditions where we might be able to provide a uniform display that enables assessment of that condition may be a place to start that folks would value because it would save them. Just to follow on, and it's a sobering comment and useful to hear. I mean, in, in having been at this for a long time myself as well, it's, it's all about, in the end, is it solving a problem that I'm confronting and I don't have, I'm not otherwise equipped to solve, or am I saving time for myself or possibly the patient, or perhaps is it related to quality or, God forbid, money? Um, you know, but these, these are the hard metrics that practicing clinicians have in their mind when they're trying to use these systems. And we've been challenged with the usability of the systems themselves, not to mention the CDS, but... Point well taken. Um, for the, so a few of the threads have come together. The sensitivity, I think in George's slides, he showed um, you want PPV if you're doing GWAS and you want sensitivity if you're doing um, clinical decision support. But you also want specificity because you don't want the alert fatigue. I think the app approach is interesting, but I worry that people just wouldn't pull. But I'm wondering, we've talked about how a success story, sort of a really clear win would be great, but how much of that is, how much of that to date has been sort of low-hanging fruit, digitized, picked out those two specific drugs, um, versus asking the doctors, where are your pain points? What are the questions that you find yourself having a problem with this and want the clinical decision support? Did you see the question in there? <laughs> So I, I was just going to say, um, I, I think that a lot of these groups spend a lot of time uh, in, engaging the clinical populations and understanding what the problems are. Um, but uh, I think partnering with groups like uh, PAT committees or 
tuber boards or what have you to find out like what are the challenges that are difficult to address um, might be um, one approach to, to, to kind of get to what are the problems where we can help. And since we spend a lot of time on pharmacogenomics, maybe if uh, like one challenge I believe where this could be helpful is if a patient has multiple medications and figuring out which is the one that's not being is, is an issue. And so maybe pharmacogenomics could help to explain like, which one should be taken off of, a, off of the list. Or it's a good point that I think it's good to go to the source of the consumers and ask them what they would prefer in such designs. And how uh, we've attempted at Mayo to do one of those uh, studies of designing uh, CDS for FH, where we did qualitative and quantitative interviews of physicians to see what they would like in such a tool. So I think it's important to take that into consideration as we design these. The tumor board idea, the tricky part with that is that my impression, not being an oncologist or anything, is that tumor boards tend to deal with the sort of zebras. They're like, wow, this is just a weird case, but we're looking for more of the 80-20. Like, what happens 80% of the time that people are looking for answers for? One other, one other, I mean, maybe related quick thought is, you know, it's, it's um, part and parcel of the knowledge engineering, knowledge management exercise, too. So it may be, and what partners did, and hopefully still does, is, you know, have these uh, subject matter expert panels that then are devo devoted to a domain and responsible for a set of the knowledge assets that are in production use. And they're, they're very tuned to both the state of the evidence, the current problems in practice typically, and will refine, if you will, what you're, what you're targeting yourself, the systems on pretty well. But that's, that's expensive to do. That goes to the other problem, though. Not everyone can do that like partners did. So therefore, we have to have the sharing paradigm. Jim? I, I totally agree with this thread of thought. And um, the only uh, other stakeholder I think that would be worth uh, uh, bringing in are financial folks. So whether it's department administrators or division administrators, because I, I think you can create the best, most interoperable solution. But then if you go to our healthcare system and the researchers and the clinicians are really interested and they say, well, we think it's going to cost like $50,000 worth of effort or, you know, 100 hours of IT time, whatever. And then they ask, so why do we want to do this? And if you don't have an answer to that, like, hey, you know, we've done the analysis, you know, it's going to save us $300,000 or whatever it is, right? Then it won't spread. Whereas if you do have that, then it's, it's more those folks are going to learn at professional clinical conferences, et cetera, and go to their IT guys and say, get this done. And it's very different when the IT informatics guys go and say, we want to do this, but we don't really have a good financial argument for it, versus the clinical financial folks come to IT and say, get this done. Uh, on that note, the CDS is really at an interface where there's a, a lot of stakeholders. I mean, ultimately the patient, but you know, there's folks in the IT community, there's folks, there's the clinical folks, there's economics, et cetera. What are the units of measure of success? I mean, are they clicks? Are they time? Are they dollars? Are they adherence to pathways? Uh, lots of different things. I don't know, maybe the three of you could comment on that, uh, starting with you, Casey. Um, units of success for CDS implementation. I guess the easiest one, it, uh, I guess, could be a, a measure of adoption in terms of if they even looked at the alert or did they just ignore it. Um, and that's something, I guess, also is being maybe explored in the, in the outcomes group as well in terms of what kinds of log data can you capture on these? For something like display-based CDS, uh, it might it might be uh, under the context where it's relevant. Do people choose to go and, and view that uh, decision support? And I, I think it's it's really dependent upon uh, what what kind of use cases we choose to focus on. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think. The, the way that we approach this um, is we say, okay, when we're, when we're going to build an app, what clinical and economic needles are we looking to, to move? And how will we measure them once we've introduced that, that app? So like for the platelet app that I showed, you know, the, the, the economic needles are, you know, it costs us a certain amount of money to transfuse a bag of platelets. And if that bag is wasted on a patient who immediately rejects it. There's a cost. So how many, how much, how much money can be saved through transfusing less platelets inappropriately? And then the, the clinical needle is how do you reduce the flip side? How do you reduce the number of transfusions you have to give these um, patients in order to maintain the platelet level 
that that you want to, you want to achieve. And yeah, so I do think a big part of of this whole process is selecting which apps you're going to build based on how significant you believe those needle movements to be. Howard, I guess the only thing I would add is, you know, you're, you, the way you set up the question was the multiple stakeholders of CDS, and that certainly is true. There's both a societal perspective, kind of the public good of improved care. Uh, there's the patient perspective, the provider perspective. I just, one thing I would add, though, from a CDS implementer's perspective, you know, we had a, a metric, the number needed to remind. Uh, how many times did you have to ping somebody to get them to do the right thing? And it was an interesting way to differentiate CDS uh, alerts and reminders, one from the other. Uh, uh, just one more thought. We have a question in the back, uh, Manoli. Hi, uh, Manoli Pereira, Northwestern. I had a question, um, or maybe a statement, or, or a thought about it, maybe a bigger picture part of uh, CDS and pharmacogenomics in particular, but maybe in other parts too. Um, and one of the problems with CDS and, and physicians or clinicians using that information is there are other things that negate the importance of genomics as we implement in, um, in patients. And I think a, a great tool would be where you have the genomics or predictive of, let's say, a pharmacogenomic response or, or phenotype of some, some sort, but then there are other patient-specific factors that may change the recommendation for that patient, and I don't just mean by algorithmic sorts of ways, which there are, but other ways as well, in which disease and or other drugs the patients are on may, may make that information either more or less uh, important. So we'll go ahead and, uh, since our time is uh, winding down, maybe get a uh, comment or two from each of you, and then I'll uh, close with some summary. So, um, so I guess a, 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 a quick comment and res so actually let me let somebody else go first. <laughs> could, could I comment on that comment? <laughs> I just wanted to second that comment that I think physicians, you know, these, these alerts pop up and you're like, well, that's not really relevant. I have to give the drug for this reason or that reason. or And, and I do worry also that alerts are set up and then data changes, right? So papers come out and say, well, that genotype's actually not that helpful in this patient population or whatever. And so you do have to avoid, I mean, it'd be nice actually to learn from that if there was some way to not annoy people and say, why are you prescribing, you know, and give people five choices or something. But I do think alerts that physicians just feel like that's not relevant to my patient very quickly get phased out. So I can say my comment now. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so I was just, th when you were talking, I was thinking about um, maybe the decision support could be like talking points for the physician when they speak with, a, with their patients versus, um, you know, and, and how that would be made available might vary. Um, but some, getting somehow getting to the, getting to what the patient is uh, values and, and taking that into consideration in whatever the ultimate decision making decision um, is important. So whether it's a uh, passive or or um, interruptive type of alert, just having um, the talking points to include their opinion in there. Yeah, if I could make two points, I I think that I do think it's important to not to to view um, clinical decision support as not just limited to the, to the event-based, alert-based um, decision support that I think that these apps may be a better model for, um, for eMERGE. And to the last question, I think that there is a real kind of fork in the road in terms of um, the potential objectives for eMERGE phase four. If we were to choose to build genetic-specific apps for managing genetic results in the EHR, I think that we can make great progress in, in, in increasing the availability of updated genetic results. I think that we could energize the creation and adoption of fire-based standards that a lot of other things could be built on. But the, 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 that type of support is likely to be less powerful in the context of 
specific clinical scenarios, then support that was built for those clinical scenarios, you know, would be where if we choose to focus on a couple of clinical scenarios, then we do exactly what was um, suggested. We, we look at how we model all of the data that's required to truly make good decisions in that area, genetic or non-genetic, and we look at how do you present that data in a way that saves people time, leads to it being adopted, and produces the outcomes that we're looking for. And I guess my last comment would just be to reemphasize the hierarchical nature of knowledge that's relevant to the exercise and the distributed network nature of that knowledge, which might need to be pulled together. But then to emphasize the, the app idea, uh, before there were smart on fire apps, we actually did an experiment building a smart documentation form, which based upon a knowledge base, guided the end user for diabetes care or cardiovascular care, what data to review, what to document, and what to order in a condition-specific order card that had all the convenience factors of documentation, uh, handouts, patient care ed, referral, and all the rest of it. And, you know, in a randomized control trial, extremely well received and was impactful on, uh, on the, uh, the quality of care. So I think this app idea is really relevant because, frankly, the current crop of EMRs, I haven't used them all, but they may not have all the feature function that we need to actually do this decision support right. So externalizing in an app that lives within the context of the EMR makes sense. Just in time, I better summarize because uh, I'm going to get kicked off. So no more questions or comments. Sorry. Um, the, uh, so in summarizing of that, um, it's really highlighted the, uh, the passive impact for Emerge 4. I think there's a, a lot that can be done to really move uh, the needle, as we've been saying. I think stimulating shareable CDS is definitely achievable, but it's going to lead to a need to maintain these resources. And, and there's a, that's not what uh, the NIH is good at, or sure should be good at. And so that has to be really well thought through for that. Um, should we be doing any EMR integration in the EMR? And I think a lot of the comments were, no, uh, we should be doing it on the EMR, not in the EMR. And so there's an opportunity to push through that. We already talked about measures of success. Um, reproducibility was highlighted as one of the initial points. I would argue that that's impossible because reproducibility assumes you're doing the same thing twice. And there is no two EMRs the same. And so it's really more, can you replicate the basic points uh, in more than one EMR? So whatever the word is for that, maybe it's reproducibility. Um, but uh, that, that part needs to be in terms of setting the, the bar. Um, the targets of CDS also were brought forward by, by Blackford and others. Um, is it the immediate clinician? Can we be stimulating CDS for other providers, even those outside of our system? I mean, we look at it as in a very short timeline. Who's CDS for now? Um, but we don't stimulate CDS for uh, the, the family practice person uh, back in Ohio, because uh, the person's in Boston for specialty care, whatever. Um, there's an opportunity there. And then, of course, the patients that were mentioned. Um, and then, uh, lastly, how do we emphasize the value of clean clinical data? Um, some of this is, is not easy to control. Most of it's not easy to control. But the, the whole system would be better, not just emerge uh, with that in place. And so I think there's a, a lot that can be done. But appreciate uh, your, your times. Um, and obviously, there's one more question to, for, the, for the break. But I've overstayed our time. So on to the next session. <laughs>